Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Welcome to 3C Amplified. I'm your host, Jacqueline Destrups, here to highlight the businesses, nonprofits, and individuals collaborating to amplify their impact in the community. This series is sponsored by Another Hand Advantage, where I create marketing strategies for community-minded small businesses and nonprofits that fit their budget and their schedule while making their brand stand out in front of your audience. And joining me in our virtual studios today is Teresa Niemeyer, Arizona Community Engagement Manager at Intel, and Barbara Blaylock, Founder and Executive Director at Treasures for Teachers. Welcome, ladies. So excited to have you uh, in our virtual studios today to talk about, gosh, talk about both of your organizations and um, also talk a little bit about how maybe some of those uh, those programs have maybe changed a little bit over the last couple of months yeah. um, with everything that's happening. So Barbara, how about we talk, um, start with you and just kind of give us an introduction here to Treasures for Teachers and what that is. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, Treasures for Teachers has been around for about 15 years. Um, As you said in my introduction, I'm the founder. And um, I saw a need out there in the community between teachers that they needed supplies. And um, they didn't have it. They were spending their own money on getting the supplies that they needed. And um, just started to collect supplies from businesses and companies across the valley with Intel being my very first. So I'm really excited to have them with us today. And our mission is to provide free and low-cost supplies to educators from the community's reusable resources. We also um, look at ourselves as being a creative reuse center. Besides the traditional supplies that teachers might need, like pencils, paper, markers, and crayons, we also have really unique items. And we have items that come from manufacturers, what we call manufacturing discards. So items that might have been through the processing um, strategy, and then they came out and The teachers use those in the classroom as manipulatives and other kinds of um, materials for the classroom, bottle caps, corks, those types of things. And so um, we serve about 5,000 teachers in the valley, and that's really just scratching the surface. There's about 90,000 teachers in the valley. So we really want more teachers to know about us and to know that we're able to help support them. Great. And Teresa, I mean, many people are familiar with Intel, but what is it that you, so unique about what you do for Intel? Well, Intel has been here in Arizona for 40 years. This is our 40th anniversary. And I'm very fortunate to work in a role where we reach out to the community and try to make sure that we're being good neighbors. And so in my role, I get to work with um fabulous organizations like Treasures for Teachers to make sure that we're being good neighbors and good community partners and helping further their missions. You know, we all rise together if we're all supporting each other and working collaboratively. So I'm very fortunate to be able to work in collaboration with some of our nonprofits to make sure we're building robust communities. So Barbara, you said 15 years, Treasures for Teachers. How did Treasures for Teachers start? Where did you even begin? Obviously, you saw you said you saw a need in the community, um, but what was it that you were doing at the time? Um, instead of you know running this nonprofit, what were you doing at that time, and how did you see that need, and kind of where did you go from there with getting this off the ground? Yeah, really good question. So I was actually the senior regional um, preschool director for the Valley of the Sun YMCA. And the YMCA was going through an accreditation process through the National Association for the Education of Young Children. And I was responsible for getting 13 of the YMCA programs accredited. And through that process, I started to find that they just didn't have the supplies they needed to meet this accreditation standards. Things like binders and tape and staplers and just your basic office supplies. And with the YMCA being a nonprofit organization, again, their finances were always stretched. So the first thing I did was I I approached Intel and I said, hey, um, we could really use um, these kinds of supplies. Do you ever have them? And um, they said, yes, we do. As a matter of fact, we do this program called Dump Your Junk every quarter. And all of the administrative assistants and um, have to clean out their desks and their offices and purge. And we would really love to give you these supplies so that you can get them out to the YMCAs. 
And that's really how it started. And it started in my garage. <laughs> so I started collecting all of these supplies in my garage. And I would go out to the YMCA's and deliver the supplies and say, look at what Intel did for us. And then I do know, um, and Teresa, I don't know if you know this story, but I do know that um, Intel has meets with a lot of the other big companies, all the community relations people. And they told um, somebody about us doing this. And I started getting calls from other companies from Wells Fargo, Motorola, saying, hey, we want to help. We have supplies. And then um, from one thing led to another. My garage was literally overflowing. <laughs> so at that point, um, I reached out to the Chandler School District, and they gave us two portables to start the organization out of. And um, it was Erie Elementary School at the time. And we were able to move all of the supplies that were in my garage into these portables and then go out. And then that's when I started to um, the program, actually left the YMCA. I got Valley Fever and got very ill. And so after I recovered from Valley Fever, kind of took the organization and um, ran with it from there, literally. Yeah. That's great. And got your garage back. <laughs> yes. My husband was happy about that. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yes. And I would have to say still to this day, we're um, sharing the good work that t for t is doing. And as we come across other organizations, we refer them to Barb. And mm -hmm. um, as, as we meet teachers, we're telling them, did you know about t for t And just being um, almost evangelical uh, about sharing the good work t for t is doing. Thank you. So, Teresa, now you've been with Intel for uh, how long did you did you say? I can't remember if you said or not. We started in 1993. Wow. But if anyone asks, I was seven when I yes. started. <laughs> <laughs> so when you started with Intel, you, you mentioned you've only been in this position for, you haven't been in this position that entire time. So when you started with Intel, kind of where did you start and how did you get to where you're at now with that? Um, so my career at Intel has um, been pretty varied. Uh, the one beautiful thing about Intel is that the opportunity to um, move around into different organizations and different departments is um, encouraged. And so I've been in our finance group. I've been in our manufacturing group as a manager in our assembly test and technology development, as well as our um, fab sort manufacturing. And uh, I've also worked in our industrial engineering group. But about five years ago, this role opened um, to where I could be full-time working with community outreach. And I've always been a serial volunteer, 700 hours a year into the community. And when I saw an opportunity to do it full-time and to be engaged and to be furthering the community full-time, I, I definitely jumped on that chance. So now they're paying me to do what I was doing in my spare time. Yeah, so. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> So what are some ways then that your Intel, that program then reaches out to nonprofits in the community? Like, for instance, um, it sounds like, you know, Barbara, uh, Treasurer of Teachers has had, you know, basically literally from the beginning has had a relationship with Intel. Um, but what are what are some other ways then, Teresa, that um, that that Intel is, is helping out? Like you said, being a good neighbor in the community and, and working with other nonprofits. Oh, for sure. So in addition to the in-kind donations, so we still to this day are doing our dump our junk um, throughout our campuses. We have about 12,000 employees that work in Arizona. And, you know, we regularly have to purge the office to make sure that we're, we're not becoming hoarders. And there's <laughs> times we find there's still useful life in, in the items that we no longer need in our daily jobs. So um, in addition to gifting that to nonprofits and other organizations in the community, T for T being probably one of the biggest ones um, because they can take so much and use so much. Uh, we have a very robust volunteer program um, and we definitely have volunteers who are in love with volunteering with T for T. Our volunteer program allows our employees to volunteer at any qualified school or 501c3 nonprofit. And our Intel Foundation then at the end of the year matches their volunteer time with a payment to the organization um, in, in the amount of $10 per hour. So we accumulate all the hours our retirees and our employees have logged toward, to T for T. And then at the end of the year, we send them a check um, for those hours. So I think it's great because not only are we able to um, allow 
T for T, the additional help and the additional work, but then they get um, a check at the end of the year for that work and that time. Yeah, I love that. So speaking of volunteers then, Barbara, how are volunteers um, involved with your organization? What kind of uh, impact are they having? Well, oh my gosh, we couldn't do what we do without in, without volunteers. Um, of course, things have changed now with COVID, but prior to COVID, we were seeing about 100 volunteers every single day, all day long. They were coming and going, helping us in all different um, aspects of the organization. So um, now with COVID, things have changed a little bit. Um, we do have volunteers doing things virtually. So we have a grab and go virtual um, program where volunteers can let us know that they're going to drive by and we're going to fill their car up. They're mostly making journals or sorting um, bottle caps into um, numbers and colors and you know other things into shapes. So um, that's working really well. And Intel is also um, involved in that. So they're coming and getting the paper and the staples and the um, supplies they need to be able to create journals for the teachers for us. And they're able, they can do it virtually because um, not just Intel, but many of the companies out there have stopped volunteering in person right now. So they are looking for opportunities to do volunteering somehow either virtually or through this grab and grow, grab and go project. And I think that's really um, a wonderful opportunity for other companies to be able to get volunteering within their companies. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. So under normal circumstances, since we're in a little bit of limbo here in Arizona with our, our kids going back to school or are they sticking with virtual, um, but under normal circumstances, how does that work then for teachers um, who who want to get some supplies from you and and maybe tell us a little bit about how that, that might be changing here with with everything that we have going on. Right. Um, so usually this in July is our busiest time of the year. It's usually like a Christmas time for um, people shopping for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And of course, this July is way different. You know, the teachers aren't in here like we would normally see in a um, July. However, they're still coming. They're just kind of walking around a little bit. Not quite sure what they need yet because it really depends on what their school decides to do, whether they're going to be distance learning or in the classroom learning. Um, so we're here, still here to serve them and to provide them the supplies and resources they need. We're of course following all of the CDC guidelines, um, making sure that they're social distancing. Everybody has to wear a mask. Um, we aren't allowing children or visitors or guests. It's just the teachers right now. So that limits how many people are in the store. We're only allowing up to 20 people in the store at a time. The store is quite big, so they're very spread out. And um, they're still able to get as many resources as they need. I think the um, big question will be when we get a little bit closer to that August 17th date and are they going back in person or will they continue to do distance learning? So I think what our um, back to school time will look like, it will look a little bit differently. So perhaps July, August, and September, it will be spread out. And the teachers will come and get supplies, but instead of them all coming in July, it'll be spread out a little bit more. And then we also have a West Valley location. It is temporarily closed right now because the business just didn't, um, wasn't there for us to stay open. Um, the West Valley teachers can still shop here. And as soon as we, the Pender, we're on the Pendergast School District site, and right now they're not allowing any of their teachers on campus. So once they allow that again, we'll reopen in the West Valley, and then the teachers in the West Valley can take advantage of the same resources that they can here. So is it like a membership? Do teachers join and then they can come in however many times and shop for their supplies or how does that work? That's a great question. Yes. So it is a membership base. It's $35 a year and they can come as often as they want and take out as much materials. We have three different shopping areas. They have a $5 fill a bag so they can take a basic grocery size bag and fill it with as much materials as they need for $5 and that includes books, which are really valuable. And then we have a free zone where everything's free. And so those can be your basic recycled materials on top of a lot of the items we get from Intel. So binders, file trays, anything for your desk that we have in abundance are absolutely free to the teachers. And then we do teacher giveaways um, all the time. So anytime a teacher comes, so right now, for example, we're giving away five reams of paper to every teacher that comes shop. That's great. What are some of you, you mentioned some of the more, uh, you know, think people think of paper, pens, pencils, things like that. But what are some of the more, I don't know, unique items that you, that you get into the store? So, yeah, it's kind of hard. They're, they're 
very unique, so it's hard to explain. Yeah. What that <laughs> we do have, we do get these little plastic um, square discs from a company that makes pacemakers, and the teachers use those in games, um, matching games. Um, of course, we get things like corks. A lot of people don't think we want corks, but the teachers use those in all sorts of things. And then we get a lot of promotional materials. So, for mm. example, we've been working with a sports company that makes sports mem- memorabilia. Mm. So we're getting all the lanyards and all the items that they would have used to um, advertise for a sports um, company. So that that's another kind of odd, different thing. And then a lot of things we get from Intel is we get file folders that have been gently used. And the teachers don't mind that at all. Sometimes they'll use those to cut out shapes. So, for oh. example, if we get used red file folders, they might cut out apples, right, out of the file folders. So the file folder is still good. A lot of people will say, oh, you probably don't want to use file folders. And I'm like, no, we absolutely want you to use file folders. <laughs> why. And then we show them how that we can reuse those file folders. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Just like you had re- referenced earlier, it's just about, it's more, it's kind of a reuse program as well. Yeah. So a lot of these things could just end up in the landfill or, you know, like Teresa was saying, you know, uh, in the bottom of somebody's desk or yeah. in the back of a supply room or something. But instead, you know, it, you're finding unique ways to get those back out into the community and to help out those teachers rather than having to go to the, the store and purchase you know, yeah. card, little cardboard apples or whatever yes. they might want to make out of those folders. Yeah. Right. So, Teresa, what are some other ways? So, you mentioned, um, so you mentioned that Intel employees can go out and volunteer, um, and like you know, hands-on type uh, things like this. But what are some other ways that volunteers, uh, Intel volunteers, are helping out in the community? Sure. So, our episodic volunteering, where we actually go down to T for T. Um, Those types of events right now are on hold um, based on our pandemic leadership team advising us all to kind of stay at home and and be safe and make sure we keep others safe. Um, But we do still have some essential work going on on site at our Intel locations here in Arizona. We have um, three large manufacturing fabrication facilities, and so they're still running 24 by 7. So one of the great things about working with T4T is she mentioned the gra- uh, Barb mentioned the grab and go bags. We actually assembled some kits, a um, uh, um, little more than a hundred of them, and left them on site for employees to grab while they were on their lunch break or before they went home, so they could take them with them to volunteer and then drop them back off. Um, so we're still being able to provide on-site volunteer opportunities for employees who are still working on site. Um, and in addition to that, we have our skills-based volunteer programs where uh, rather than those episodic opportunities, we have our employees who are helping with anything from web design to software development to um, financial planning. Um, again, with 12,000 employees at, in Arizona, they have all sorts of skills that they're willing to lend out to nonprofits. So there's still some of that going on, provided we can do it virtually. And then I think one of the other uh, neat things is that we have a ton of employees who are also board members. Um, I do believe we've had a board member with T4T for, for almost its inception. Um, it has, yep. It is. <laughs> Um, but we have our employees who are passionate about organizations in the community and serve on their boards to help them further their um, further their uh, missions. So it's been great that way. And what is the general, um, I guess, general feeling around volunteering throughout throughout Intel? Is it something that is uh, expected of employees or is it something, you know, how are they finding out about all these volunteer opportunities and what it is to get involved in the community? Right. So we encourage it. It's part of our DNA. It's part of our who we are at Intel that um, we encourage all of our employees to volunteer. We don't put a limit on how often they can volunteer. They just have to have a discussion with their manager about being able to support it if it's during work hours, just making sure that they can get everything done. And we have employees who give thousands of hours each year. It's almost like they have a second full-time job. Um, This year is a little bit different because of everything going virtually. It's a little bit harder to get them out in the community. But on average, we see anywhere between 40 and uh, 60% of our employees in any given year going out and volunteering at least some something, doing something. So um, we're really excited that they're passionate about supporting the community and encourage them to do that as often as possible. 
And you mentioned before, too, when you were talking about the um, the volunteer hours being tallied and then at the end of the year, an actual monetary donation from the Intel Foundation being made. And I want to say I heard you say something about retirees in there. So what is yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So we don't limit it just to our active employee volunteers. Any of our retirees who have left from Intel are also able to participate in our volunteer programs. So um, we do still have a lot of retirees in the Valley and they are active and volunteering. And then one of the cool things that we have at Intel that we provide to our employees is when they're transitioning into retirement and and getting to the point in their career where they are ready to, to um, to move on to retirement, we find that they're not very good at sitting still. So <laughs> we offer this um, amazing opportunity for them to uh, do Encore fellowships. So they work with the uh, nonprofit Experience Matters, and Experience Matters helps connect them with other nonprofits who need their skills and their um, volunteer or their time in the community. So we pay a grant to Experience Matters to cover the cost of them to um, have a, a, basically it's like a paid internship and it's a thousand hours that they give over the course of the year to a nonprofit to help them. And Barb's actually had a few folks who've retired from Intel and fallen in love with what T4T is doing. And even after their own core fellowships are done, they end up sticking around and being serial volunteers in their retirement. So not only is it the benefit of the Encore Fellowship for 1,000 hours, but they'll stick around and do that volunteer time and get that same $10 an hour match. So it's kind of a, a from the, the beginning of your career, even into your retirement, but Intel supporting our employees to support nonprofits in the community. Wow, that's amazing. And actually, that leads into, I was actually going to ask, um, Barbara, Tell are there volunteers who've been with you for you know, just years and, and just don't want to leave, just want to stay. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, it's, it just makes it, they feel like they're part of the organization and they feel like some type of ownership. Right. Um, but definitely with Intel as well, um, actually Kristen Marshall, who, um, was actually the very first, one of my very first board members today, she was one of those encore um, volunteers. She finished her encore position and she is now our outreach coordinator. She's still helping us. She's still working for us. She's going out and she can tell the story so well because she was the very first board member um, from Intel and that helped us grow. So yeah, the volunteers just have, I, I don't know what we would do about them. It's unfortunate with the situation that we're in right now, but I do believe we'll see those 100 volunteers come back walking through these doors. I sometimes say that kind of the heartbeat of t for t has been taken away right now, and we need CPR to kind of make it come back to life. And as soon as this pandemic's over and those volunteers are back in here, it's going to feel so normal again, because right now it does kind of feel like there's something missing. And it's the, it's the volunteers for sure. Yeah. Yeah, volunteers can be some of the best ambassadors um, for that very reason that you mentioned, Barbara, just because they do know kind of the, the heart of the organization um, and they know, know it from the perspective of somebody coming from the outside and coming in and then just feeling like they're really a, a part of that organization. And then they can go out and share those stories and hopefully bring in, you know, more volunteers and organizations that can help out with, you know, uh, not just volunteering, but donations. Um, it's such a great, uh, just a, a great asset to any nonprofit is having that strong volunteer base. Yes, of course. What are some ways then that you're staying kind of engaged with volunteers, given that, like you said, they're not being able to come in in the, in the capacity that they were before? What are some ways that you're still keeping them engaged so that, um, when we, you know, you can open the doors again and we can have everybody back, um, back into these spaces, um, they're still, you know, you're still top of mind and they still want to be back. Right. So I think communication is really important. And so what we did is we've sent out two, I think one, one kind of email to them and then two follow-up emails with surveys, asking them what they need, where, what their comfort level was, and giving them the opportunity to tell us how we can make the organization comfortable for them to either come back or do the grab-and-go volunteer activities until everybody kind of feels safe. Our volunteers are of the really um, the age that's critical, you know, the critical mm-hmm. care age. Right. So we wanted, we wanted to be really, really careful and conscious of that. Mm-hmm. 
And so they shared if they were comfortable or not. And then the ones that were comfortable are coming back. They are signing waivers saying that they haven't been exposed or anything like that each time they come. And then they're engaged. We just have to do it a little bit different. They're a lot more separate. So, you know, before we would have 10 people in a room together and they would be laughing and drinking coffee and volunteering at the same time. Now that's not so much. We have two or three people in the same room, but they're still here. And as things get better, we will see more and more um, volunteers coming back. Yeah, that's great. And I, we can see behind you every so often I see somebody <laughs> scurrying past with a box of this or a bag yeah. of that or something. So you can tell that things are still humming along there, just yeah. at a little bit of a lower capacity. Right. Um, and I do have to say Barb has made it just extremely easy to work with her. And, and oh, she's been you. communicating um, and letting us know what they're able to do. And even with our grab and go opportunities, we're literally just pulling up with a car, popping the trunk, and she has people who are loading the trunks with the materials for these grab and go activities. So there's been the no contact. It's been very, very easy. And she's been very accommodating to be able to fit into working with us with our um, boundary conditions for our volunteers. And Teresa, I imagine those types of, um, like you said, ease of you, ease of being able to still work with them is important for the types of nonprofits then that you at Intel ends up um, partnering with. Um, it makes it a lot easier if you, you know exactly what it is that they need and they can communicate that to you. Um, what are some other ways then that you are, you know, you're working with nonprofits? I know you mentioned you know, volunteers, um, but what are some other ways that Intel is helping other organizations in the community? Yeah, so we, uh, as I mentioned, it's a whole lot of virtual stuff or it's uh, volunteer activities that we can do from a virtual site. So we have the grab and go type of activities going on, but we're also doing some video mentoring. Um, we've got some first Lego league teams that we've got with kiddos and through Girl Scouts and Boys and Girls Clubs and through some schools, we have some of our um, technical um, engineers working with the kiddos and sharing what their jobs are and what they're doing. And it, although there are some challenges with uh, trying to be a coach for a Lego team uh, virtually, <laughs> they're, they're making the attempt and they're trying to make sure that that's happening. Um, so I do know that our employees are excited to get back to an in-person um, at some point in time, but they are still trying to forge ahead and still con connect with the community in these virtual spaces. Yeah, but what a great way to to even be able to continue that though, because it could have been it could have been easy to say, well, we can't do any of that. Let's just focus on focus on what work we can get done from where we can get it done. But you know, to be able to still say. If we can, we're going to make it happen, even if it's virtually, and even if it's like you said, coaching Lego teams. <laughs> what are they building? What is what is the Lego project that they're that they're working on? Is it a contest or competition or it's robotics? Yeah, first Lego League. Uh, they'll have a a challenge that's issued to them at the beginning of the school year about how to make their robots box function and how to navigate a course, there'll be a specific challenge that changes every year. So right now in anticipation of that, they're working on coding and working on, um, you know, the, the parts and pieces that go into a robot so that they can be prepared once the challenge is issued, that they can kind of go attack that. So they've got the base foundation set up. So it's rather interesting to try to, to try to do that virtually, but it's a, it's a great way to still connect with the kids and make sure that they've got STEM activities going on still. Yeah. So you've mentioned uh, quite a few of the experiences that you've mentioned, Teresa, have evolved around um, education and organizations that are providing, uh, like t for t providing supplies to educators. Is that one of the main focuses then for Intel when they're working with um, nonprofit organizations? Is there anything uh, like a specific, um, you know, that, they are, that they're looking for when they're partnering with a nonprofit in the community? Sure. So, you know, we are a tech, uh, technology company, so a lot of our employees are technically trained, a lot of engineers. Um, so many times they do gravitate towards those STEM or STEAM type of activities. However, you know, again, with 12,000 employees, their um, passions span the gamut. So we have employees who are passionate about animal care, and we do match um, time, volunteer time for, say, foster um, folks who are fostering animals in their home. And we have seen a whole bunch of employees since they're working from home 
uh, head to the shelters and take take on a, some dogs or cats to be able to take them, keep them company while they're working from home. So we've seen a lot of engagement even there, an uptick there, but they do tend to gravitate a lot towards those uh, STEM type of activities. Um, and I think T4T has uh, lots of intersection points there where there's making, allowing for those supplies for the STEM activities to happen. They're supporting teachers, which our employees are also passionate about. So there's a lot of uh, points that T4T has that really make our employees excited to work with them. And you, you mentioned before a volunteer that went on to become, you know, a, well, was a board member and went on to become your outreach coordinator. Um, Teresa, I imagine you probably hear a lot of different stories from the volunteers over the years and, and kind of that ripple effect of they just start off as, oh, I'm just going to volunteer a couple hours for this organization. And then they go on to who knows what. Any stories come to mind that you would want to share about those types of experiences? Oh, for sure. I think there's um, one employee. Um, she was actually named our Intel Global Hero Award. Uh, it was last year. So the best of the best of all of our 110,000 employees worldwide, she was selected as um, one of the the most dedicated, I would say. But she started off first volunteering at a, uh, a shelter that was um, providing meals for um, homeless on the, on the weekends. And what built, built from there is she, she has a passion for education and herself comes from an area where education opportunities were very prevalent. And so she saw the, the families that were coming through the shelters. And well, fast forward 10 years, she started a, her own nonprofit called Education Empowers that is actually dedicated to helping um, connect marginalized kiddos and communities to STEM opportunities. And so she has robotics clubs that are at 20 plus um, other organizations now that, that bring in kiddos across the valley. Um, and the program has even expanded into California and Oregon. And we just have a chapter starting up in India. So it's great to see that an employee's passion with a little bit of support can grow to be something so huge and so, so vast. So that there's a lot of dedication and heart. They start off as volunteers, but then they end up falling in love with the mission of our nonprofits. And they stick around and give them give it their all. Yeah, and I think you mentioning the support there is kind of that key to um, to you know it's it's one thing to engage your employees uh, or to let them know, hey, we value uh, you volunteering in the community, but then to back that up to be able to give them that support. And like you mentioned, um, you know not having limits on how many hours that they can volunteer and, you know, having that incentive of for however many hours, you know, you're not just giving your time to this nonprofit, but that can also turn into, you know, dollars at the end of the year for that nonprofit. I imagine for a lot of employees that, you know, become especially passionate about this, it's because there is that support that they continue on doing, um, doing those things with those organizations and continuing on, even, you know, maybe not just with one organization, but even finding other organizations to work with. Yeah, they, they do. They end up finding that it builds. And we have another program, too, that we allow our employees to participate in. It's our employee matching gifts program. So if our employees make a fi personal financial donation to a nonprofit, the, the Intel Foundation then matches that donation dollar for dollar. And an employee can submit for up to $10,000 every year to be matched to any organization. You know, it all starts with that first volunteer event. They walk in the door. They have a great time with Barb sorting and putting things away and supporting and building folders and, you know, having that great teamwork networking time. And then it grows into they become personal donors and, you know, board members and connected for life. So the the welcoming attitude of a lot of the nonprofits in our community is what makes that easy connection for employees to continue to be giving and, and helping um, for years. Right. And like we were talking about before, it just goes back to that nonprofit, you know, looking at the volunteers as um, really as an asset. And just as much as they're looking at the dollars that are coming in, looking at the volunteer hours that are coming in as well, because those things can be, you know, changed into easily, you know, money um, to help support the nonprofit later down the road. Um, and it just takes that time for 
the organization to really support those volunteers. And, you know, Barbara, it sounds like you guys do a really great job of, you know, engaging the volunteers and making them feel like, um, I think, you know, you said it best when you said they have that sense of ownership um, Mm -hmm. and like they really are part of, um, of your organization. What are some ways then that you, you know, if another organization out there is listening to this and they're saying, oh gosh, we really, you know, our volunteer program, we're just starting out. What's some advice then that you have for other organizations if they're really trying to, to boost the use of volunteers within their organization and, and keep them on for years so that they do turn into those, those people who decide to down the line, you know, be an outreach coordinator or whatever that might look like? I think my best advice would be to treat them like they were a guest in your home and make sure that they have the best experience and all of their needs are met when as when they're there in the organization. Never to forget, you know, to let them know where the restroom is and the kitchen is and the snacks are and be there to show them that we you're a guest and we want to be able to serve you while you're serving us at the same time. Being available to them. Um, They always, always are so interested in the mission and the story of the organization. Um, I think that's really what connects them. So we always give them a mini orientation when they come in, especially in a big group. Sometimes it's hard. Um, Intel can send up to 50 people at one time. So what we will do is we will break them up into smaller groups. And several of us will do the whole little orientation. And then we'll give them a tour of the organization So just giving them that story and that understanding and then the impact that their service is going to mean and who it's going to reach. You know, we talk a lot about how we serve teachers, but really we're serving students. We're serving teachers through students or students through teachers. And it's a big, big impact because each teacher, when we look at a teacher that comes in here, we're looking at that teacher that can impact at the minimum 30 students, right? So it's a huge impact. But having um, the volunteers here and being available to them, I think making sure that they have the best experience possible is really the key to wanting them to come back. And then also to wanting to volunteer on their own. We get many Intel um, volunteers that will want to come volunteer on their own, or they also um, donate their own private stuff. So they'll bring donations to us privately all the time, not just from Intel, but their own personal home goods or home wares. I have volunteers that will collect the bottle caps for us or their toilet paper rolls or paper towel rolls or Kleenex boxes. All of that really makes a big difference in the organization. And then Teresa, for businesses out there, large or small, that are looking for ways, again, to, you know, maybe engage their employees, um, what are some things that they can do to kind of get started with, you know, working with a nonprofit in their community? What are, what are some tips that maybe you have for making sure that that's a successful partnership? Sure. Well, I think Barb is exemplifying what makes a good partnership with working with a nonprofit and a business is um, we have some regular conversations about what they're doing at T4T, what we're doing at Intel, what, what our volunteers are interested in and try to find those points of intersection. Barb isn't trying to remodel her business to get Intel to come in and volunteer. She's telling us what they're doing and we try to find those points where it makes sense for us to work together. And um, she's been very good about thinking outside of the box or making us think outside of the box so that we can find those collaboration opportunities to um, meet the needs of the volunteer desires that are for as well as while we're still supporting the mission that she has. And I think having those conversations with um, and between any business and nonprofit is, is the great starting point. Um, instead of trying to force fit something, trying to find those natural points of intersection where you can help each other with your common goal, commonly shared goals. Yeah, I really like that. And looking at what your missions and values are and how they align with a nonprofit, because it could be that, um, like you mentioned before, you have some employees that, um, you know, they what they want to work with animals, you know, because that's something that they're really passionate about. But what is it? What what would happen if Intel said, no, sorry, our main focus is we're only working with organizations that, you know, have are aligned with this and then and then you're leaving them kind of out of that mix. And um, so looking for those different, you know, not just for what aligns for you, but what aligns for your employees as well and what they're looking for in those opportunities. 
And some of them are really looking for those skills-based opportunities. So maybe they are interested in helping the animal organization, but they have allergies or something. So working directly with the animals. However, they can come in and they can help maybe design some marketing materials or help enhance their website. So there's all those points of intersection that sometimes I think um, we get a little myopic in our views about what it is we need or what it is we want. And we sometimes forget the, the other things that we could be ha- could be happening or we could be engaging with. And I think that's the, the great partnership that we have with T4T T is that constant communication about what they're doing, how they're changing, how they're evolving, how we're changing, how we're evolving, and, and then being able to just make those connections between what both of us are working on. So Barbara, where do you where does T for T go go from here? Now, like I know you mentioned, it's uh, you know things are kind of up in the air with are we going back to school, are we not going back to school? But you know, but big picture, I mean, things will get back and kids will get back into school at, at some point in time. Um, what are what are some things that you're really looking forward to as far as Treasures for Teachers and what you've got on the horizon for Treasures for Teachers? That's a great question. So first, I'm looking forward to reopening our West Valley site so we can serve the teachers out there. But we also have a program called T for T on Wheels. And um, Kristen is actually part of that as the outreach coordinator. And we take school supplies brand new to the schools that need it the most. And um, this year is going to be even more important because from what we understand, there's going to be a higher need for more school supplies especially if students are learning from home and learning from the classroom, they're going to need two sets of supplies. Or if they're learning from the classroom, um, there's no more sharing of supplies within the classroom because of the virus. And so the teachers are going to need to provide more supplies to their students individually. So I'm looking forward to being able to go out and get these supplies into the hands of the teachers and students that need them the most. And we get to do that because we have a lot of sponsors and donors out there that help us financially offset the costs that it takes to, um, to take these school supplies out to them. So really just trying to get out and go to where they need us. You know, the teachers don't always have to come to us and sometimes it is problematic for them to come to us. They can't get here either for time or, you know, money or whatever reason it is. So being able to go out to these schools that are, that maybe are, farther away from us or if they just can't get to us for whatever reason, being able to um, distribute school supplies to them um, is what I'm looking forward to. Yeah. And as far as the teachers, how do they get involved with the program? We talked a little bit about how it is membership based. What do the teachers need to do if they aren't already involved with Treasures for Teachers? Yeah. So um, teachers really just need to come come on in. Um, All they need to do to prove that they're a teacher is show us a, a badge. Most teachers have a school ID badge or a part of their contract or be um, on the website or a letter from their principal. So really simple to qualify. And then they can just come in. We give every teacher a tour. So we make sure that it's a good fit for them. I tell you that 90% of the teachers sign up right after that tour because um, it's quite overwhelmingly wonderful for them to see. And um, then they can come as often as they want, which is really nice. There's no limit on anything that they can take out, which is also another great benefit. Some programs similar to us do put limits on things. And I really believe that if they need 50 um, folders, they need 50 folders. And I don't want to say, oh, you only get 10. So they really, there's no limit. If they want to fill one $5 bag, they can. If they don't want to fill any and they just want to come get stuff from our free zone and then our giveaway, they can do that as well. Um, and they can come from all over the state. And as a matter of fact, even if there's teachers visiting from out of the state, we have what's called a day pass. And they can come in and shop for one day um, for $10. And um, it's really quite fun for them and to be able to go back to their state and say, look what I found when I was in Arizona. <laughs> yeah. Next thing you know, that's going to be teacher road trips coming yes. out to Treasures for Teachers. <laughs> yeah, we get that from Flagstaff and Yuma. They do come down from those and, and they come on road trips. hmm uh-huh. Great. And Teresa, as far as the programs that you've got going with Intel, what are some things that you're really looking forward to in the coming months and, and oh, as we look out in the next year or so? Any, any new updates to the program or things that you're really looking forward to? Well, we're really um, incentivized to uh, expand our skills-based volunteer programs. Um, we will always love our episodic, our showing up to paint a house or our you know, clean up a park. 
However, we're really excited to expand the skills-based volunteerism because we just feel that it's so much more impactful for the organizations Mm -hmm. where maybe 20 hours invested by a software programmer can solve a, you know, half million dollar problem that a nonprofit is wrestling with. And so we're really looking to just deploy our employees into those skills-based opportunities so that they can do some impactful capacity building for the nonprofits in the Valley. Um, You know, it may not generate a ton of those matching grant hours to spend 20 hours. However, the the returns that it may make for the organizations that they're helping are just pay the dividends. You know, if they're able to save some headcount or they're able to increase their services that they're able to provide based on our employees' contributions. Um, we're, we're very excited to see that happen and that change. So we're putting, as part of our 2030 goals, we're putting a lot of emphasis on um, encouraging our employees to engage in those skills-based opportunities. Yeah, I really like that you, you kind of pointed that out as far as what that looks like. It may not, like you said, it may not look like a lot of um, hours at the end of the year that from that turn into that monetary donation, but I think skills-based, I think it's getting better. I think more and more uh, companies are really looking at that and, and nonprofits are, are looking at ways that they can incorporate that into uh, what they do. But um, I think for for Far too long, that skills-based volunteering was kind of overlooked, or it was difficult for poor people to find those opportunities. And it's so much easier if your company is behind you and is saying, "We know you love to, you know, you know you like to do this here at work, at the office, and wherever that office may be these days." But what if you used a couple hours of that time and you did this work for somebody else? And like you said, it could mean the difference between, you know, saving thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars um, in the long run for that for that organization when they can use somebody, especially with a high, really high skill set of, uh, you know, something technical, which is always going to cost a lot of money. <laughs> right, right. You know, most nonprofits don't have the opportunity to have, say, industrial engineers on staff to be able to do some analysis as far as um, productivity and workflow and setup like that. Um, and it's probably not in their budget to go hire a consultant at you know, a few hundred dollars an hour to go do that. However, if you can get a professional in the industry to come in and provide those services for free, you may be increasing the productivity of your organization you know, based on those 20 hours that were invested by a, a professional. So there's a huge cost avoidance for the organization and they are able to expand their capacity or be able to serve more clientele. So we're really excited to um, see our employees making those types of differences for our community. We just, we see it as something that'll move the needle even further in building a more robust uh, functioning community. Mm -hmm. Well, as we wrap up the show today, I want to give you both a couple minutes here to let us know anything else that uh, our listeners need to know if they want to reach out and be involved. So Barbara, we'll start with you. Um, Obviously, uh, right now, like you have mentioned, um, volunteer opportunities are a bit limited, but, you know, it sounds like you've got some virtual things that people could be doing as well. Um, But how else can we, how else can the community support you and uh, Treasures for Teachers and how do they do it? (laughs) Right, great, great questions. Um, The first thing is, Um, If they're listening to this and they know a teacher, tell that teacher that we're here to help them. We're here as a resource for those teachers. We hear it all the time that teachers had no idea we were here. So spreading the word that Treasures for Teachers is here to support teachers, to get the supplies into their hands so they can get into their students' hands, that's one of the biggest things that would really, really help us. Of course, volunteering, we're still accepting volunteers on site. So if they're comfortable coming on site and following the guidelines of the CDC, um, we would love to have them. We need help sorting. You know, with so many less volunteers right now, the, the need is even greater. So sorting donations and getting things on the shelves for the teachers and cleaning items and pricing items, all of those things. So we can certainly use volunteers. If they aren't comfortable, we definitely can do the grab and go Um, projects for them. They can come and do that. And then lastly, donations. We always, always need donations, no matter what it is, new and gently used. I didn't mention also that we have a little thrift store connected right next to us. And the purpose of the thrift store is to provide scholarships for the membership for teachers that can't afford a membership. 
So if a teacher were to come and say, hey, I simply can't afford it. I haven't had my first paycheck yet or times are rough and I can't do it. The proceeds from the thrift store will provide a scholarship for the teachers. Um, but then we need donations for the thrift store to, to be able to um, make that happen. So any kind of um, items that you would give to any typical thrift store is the same kind of items that we also take. In addition, we um, pick up donations for free all over the Valley. And all they have to do is call us at 480-751-1122 and get us on the um, schedule. We pick up as long as you have 20 boxes or more, we will pick up for free anywhere in the Valley. Oh, that's great. And then uh, any other information I'm assuming on the website, they can head on over to the website and find out about donating, whether it's uh, in-kind goods or, or, or money, they can find that on the yes. website. Yes. So financial donations, um, easy to do on the website, right at the top, it'll say donate funds and you can do that. Um, our website's treasures, the number four teachers.org. Perfect. Thank you so much, Barbara. Yeah, thank and you. Teresa, so um, organizations out there looking for ways to get um, Intel involved with their organization, uh, how do they become involved? And um, I'm assume, I assume employees too probably come to you with different organizations that they'd like to, to volunteer with. So absolutely, absolutely. I connect with nonprofits uh, every week, new nonprofits through employee recommendations or employee referrals or them just reaching out. We have a externally facing site on our corporate social responsibility where you can connect with us there and we can set up some time to chat about what your organization is doing and your organization's needs. And then we've also got a Facebook page, Intel Involved Arizona, um, that um, we monitor and will um, connect with organizations that reach out to us that way. And I would just also encourage peer organizations out there to really, you know, adopt that dump your junk model. It's such a great way to um, support sustainability efforts in extending the useful life of those um, items. Um, I know for a fact that 80 office chairs, ergonomic office chairs, fit in Barbara's uh, uh, pickup truck. Uh, or, <laughs> <laughs> because we've done some office renovations where we've yes. had, you know, gently used office chairs that we no longer needed. Um, but she was able to then turn around and distribute to teachers. So, you know, I would really think about not only those personal donations, but if you're in a business, think about those things that still have useful life because they can be put to use back out in the community. Yes. And help and somebody there to help take it off your hands too, because a lot of times it's just a logistics thing where people think, oh, it's just so much easier for me to just throw this away or stick it out on the curb because I don't want to have to deal with it. But if you've got organizations out there like Treasures for Teachers are like, hey, we will come pick that stuff up for you, <laughs> make it easy on you. Um, it, yeah, it just, it makes it so much easier all the way around. So well, thank you both so much um, for joining me today. Um, fantastic information on both sides, um, both organizations. Just love what you're both doing in the community um, and just can't wait for um, things to, you know, the dust to settle here and for things to get back to a little bit more normal um, operations so that both organizations, so Teresa, your volunteers can get back out there and doing more of that hands-on stuff and Barbara so that um, you can get those volunteers and teachers back in the doors there and get their hands on all of those supplies. So thank you both so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. You've been listening to 3C Amplified, where we share how others are connecting, creating, and collaborating to amplify their impact. And we hope we've inspired you to do the same in your community. If you are a fellow change maker and want to build connections, create relationships, and collaborate with others to make positive change, join the online community built to support and engage people like you wanting to amplify their impact in communities around the world. Visit 3CAmplified.com slash community to learn more. Until next time, I'm Jacqueline Destrems with Another Hand Advantage. Let me help create a digital marketing strategy to put your organization's mission in front of your target audience and highlight the impact you are having in your community. Visit anotherhandadvantage.com to learn more and connect. Mm-hmm.